Come for the bread, stay for the politics. I'm Ben Walsh, and this is Let Them Eat Bread. Today on Let Them Eat Bread, we are going back to my classic challah recipe, which means we need to do all the things that we usually do for our classic challah recipe. Today, I'm also going to be employing uh, a standing mixer to knead our dough. Uh, I will be telling you how to do this even if you don't have a standing mixer, so don't worry about that. But first, we need to start with our yeast mixture. So I have about six ounces of water here, uh, about 110 degrees. Um, if you don't have a thermometer to figure out how hot yours is, the best way to do this is to take your pinky and to dip it in the water. Obviously, make sure it's clean. If it feels warm enough that you'd want to take a bath or a shower in it, that's about 110 degrees. Not hot like you're in a sauna, but just warm enough to take a bath in. So we're going to add to that our sugar and our yeast. So I have a tablespoon of sugar here mixed in with just less than a tablespoon of yeast. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna lightly shake this over. So the warmth of the water is to bring the yeast kind of back to life. The yeast is dehydrated. And we're gonna take our fork, oh, so the sugar is to feed the yeast, and we're gonna take our fork and we're gonna use a, a rounding motion like this, and just lightly fluff our yeast and our sugar so it begins to dissolve. The yeast will not dissolve, but the sugar should. So you should see a little cloudy mixture, like you can see here with mine. And we're gonna cover that and set a timer for 10 minutes. The yeast blooming, oh, and remember to cover it. The yeast blooming can take anywhere between five and 20 minutes, but because we're adding sugar, the yeast should bloom a little faster. If you're not using sugar for whatever reason, your yeast may take a little longer to bloom, but that's okay. The purpose of blooming the yeast is twofold. One, to wake it back up from its slum slumber and essentially tell it, hey, time to get to work. And also to check to make sure that the yeast you have is still good. If the yeast you have is not still good, then after five to 10 minutes, um, you won't see any reaction with it, in which case you'll need to start over with fresh yeast. In a separate bowl, we're taking an additional six ounces of water. Now this has been warmed to about 100 degrees. Keep in mind that it doesn't actually need to be this warm. The reason I do this with my challah recipe is because I'm usually taking my fresh water right out of the refrigerator and adding it cold can sometimes be detrimental to the process and to warming the dough. So what I like to do instead is I like to warm my water to about 100 degrees and allow it to come down to room temperature. It doesn't need to be warm. So to that, we're going to add our eggs. So our eggs are going to be uh, two whole large eggs and one large egg yolk. Let's give that a quick whisk here. Move that a little closer to me. Okay. All right. So the next thing we're going to add to this mixture is we're going to add seven tablespoons of canola oil. Okay, just give that a quick whisking. So this is this mixture here is where uh, a good chunk of our liquid for the bread is going to come from. So it's important to have these ratios pretty close to right. Now the nice thing about most bread recipes is that if for some reason you don't get the ratios right the first time, um, most bread recipes are pretty forgiving. Uh, you're going to be able to kind of play around a little bit uh, with the bread recipe and add a little water if, if, if you need it, a little bit of flour if you need it. Um, so don't worry too much about that. The next thing we're gonna add, because I like to make my challah a sweet challah, is we're gonna add seven tablespoons of honey. Now you can use any honey. I'm using store-bought wildflower honey. So we're just gonna get this in. This is where all of our sweetness is gonna come from, by the way. Um, if you want to make this recipe with sugar, just remember, uh, instead of honey, just remember you need to find another way to get the, li the, uh, the liquid measure in because the honey is not just adding sweetness um, in a very concentrated way. It's also adding a little bit of liquid to our liquid mixture here. Whereas if you use sugar, 
it's going to be more akin to a dry ingredient like a fl like flour or salt or something and will take away from your bread. So you'll just need to find a different way to get that liquid in there, whether you add more water um, or more oil. It just kind of depends uh, on what you want it to do. Okay. All right, so we're gonna mix this, being careful not to get it all over the place. So while you're doing this, you should also be checking your yeast mixture. Uh, you can see ours right here. Um, but if you have yours sat somewhere else, typically I put mine to the side, but I thought I'd show you all today just so you could actually watch it bloom. So once this is all mixed, we should have a couple minutes left on our timer. Let's take a look. Okay, so it's been about four or five minutes. And by the way, sometimes that's all you're gonna need. So don't worry about it if for some reason um, your yeast blooms a lot faster than mine or your yeast blooms a lot slower than mine. The key, as well as patience with this bread, is just to make sure that all the ingredients do what they're supposed to. All right, so we finished mixing this. You can see now that I have a nice mixture um, of my eggs, my of my second set of water, my oil, and my honey. And this is gonna be the primary base, the primary liquid base for our bread, other than, of course, the yeast mixture we've got going here. Okay. Now we need to prepare our, um, our dry ingredients. I'm, as I said, I'm using a standing mixer, so I'm gonna take a, the standing mixer bowl and uh, start preparing my ingredients in here. Excuse me. So first I have our flour. We have about, uh, we have about six cups of flour here, so we're just gonna put this in here. You don't need to sift this flour. You don't need to do anything special uh, with this flour. Just measure it out and put it in. Now, if you're doing this in a bowl as opposed to a standing mixer, you don't need to pour the flour into another mixer. What you can do is you can just take your hand and start to move the flour to the edge of the bowl to create a little well inside which is going to go our liquids. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to allow the standing mixer actually to create the well for us with the dough hook. So now that we've done that, we're going to add our salt. Um, I, tend, I tend to use about a tablespoon of salt, but it really depends on how, uh, on how salty you want it to be. Salt's really there just to reinforce the flavor. <clears throat> so really not putting that much in. But it's completely up to you. If you don't like salt or you don't want salt in it, um, you're welcome to not use any salt at all. I would recommend just a tiny bit of salt though. So if you aren't a fan of salt or you're worried that the salt is gonna fundamentally change the sweetness of your bread, um, I would still put in a little pinch. I'm using kosher salt, so it's a nice pinch uh, if you wanna use kosher salt, but regular table salt or any other salt is fine. At the end of the day, the salt's gonna get worked into the dough and more or less not be independent of the other, uh, the other ingredients. So you don't have to worry too much about what kind of salt you're using. But I, I find that a tablespoon of salt is really a great, uh, a great amount of salt for this recipe. So let's put this on our standing mixer real quick and give it 30 seconds to create that little well. Now, when you're mixing this, you're gonna do it on the lowest setting on the standing mixer. Um, if you have a spatula or a whisk or something, you can use that to mix together your, your flour and your salt. Again, at the end of the day, you just wanna make sure that there's a little cup, a little well in the middle of your dry ingredients mixture in order for you to place your liquids in. And the reason you do this, most importantly of all, is so that you're not, so that you're allowing it to kind of start to mix in even before you start mixing it. Additionally, if you don't put things, if you don't put your liquids in a well, what's gonna happen is the dry ingredients and the wet ingredients are gonna sit on top of each other. And although they're definitely not going to mix, the other problem is once you start mixing, it's gonna slosh around everywhere, you're gonna make a big mess. So you're putting the well in your dry ingredients for a number of reasons. One more thing unrelated to this, if 
Uh, we are making my classic challah recipe this week. And uh, But if there is a recipe that you want to see made on the show, send us a message at our Facebook page, Let Them Eat Bread, uh, facebook.com slash Let Them Eat Bread Show, uh, a link to which you can find in the description below. You can also find our YouTube page uh, in the description below for all of our episodes. This week, we will be cutting up this episode as well as the, the all the previous episodes and releasing them. I'm going to schedule them to release so that if you want, you'll see the episodes come out in order that uh, in the order that they should be to make sure that the newest episodes are near the top and the oldest episodes are near the bottom. But that way, if you just want to watch politics episodes, you can. If you just want to watch bread making episodes, you can. Um, or if you want to watch the entire episode, you're welcome to do that too. But they're all going to be in a separate playlist on the channel so you can see more or less uh, the content that you want to see. And we'll be doing that from now on. So hopefully what will happen in the future is you'll have one long episode like we're doing now uh, on the stream every week. And then a, a, a day or two after that, probably Monday, you'll see um, however many clips come from that week's episode. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, either see the whole show or watch whatever content you want just on the Monday uh, when you're getting ready for whatever it is you're, you're doing for the week. All right, so our timer is about to go off, so let's just take a quick look at our um, at our well here, and then we'll examine our yeast mixture. So it's going to be hard to show because the flower is going to move a lot, but there is a well here. There's a pretty significant well here. The, the dough hook has essentially created a little wall of dry ingredients that our wet ingredients are going to go in. So we're going to bring this back here for the initial mixing. Let's take a look at the yeast mixture. All right, so you can see here the yeast mixture that we've got essentially, I'm just going to cover this real quick. You can see this kind of foamy, bubbly layer on this means our yeast is alive and well. So we are ready to get moving. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to pour in our yeast mixture, making sure that all of the foam and goodness is in there. Okay. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pour in our egg, oil, and honey mixture. Okay, so now, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, no, it's gonna be hard for you to see this. Um, but anyway, so the, the lake was actually sitting in the nice little well that we've created. So that's gonna be really easy to mix around. So I'm gonna put this on the stand mixture and I'll talk a little bit about how to do this if you don't have. So because we're just barely mixing our ingredients together, we're gonna to start on the lowest speed. We will turn the speed up. We will turn the speed up as soon as we get a rough shaggy ball together. Now there are two other ways you can do this if you're not using a standing mixer. The first way is in the bowl, right? Uh, like I showed you with the red bowl, if you've created your little well and you've put your liquid ingredients in there, you wanna take your spatula. You don't wanna use a whisk at this point. The bread will just get caught up in there. So you wanna take a flat, service either a wooden spoon or a spatula and you want to start folding in your uh your ingredients so the way you do this if you're not familiar with the folding technique is you're going to take just show you so you're going to take this and you're going to scoop underneath and then fold back on top and then push back on top so every time that you go you're just going to keep that circular motion and you're going to want to turn the bowl so that you're um so that you're folding different portions of the ingredients every single time and you're going to keep doing that until a rough ball of dough comes together, and then you're going to really start the kneading process. If you're doing this on a board um, with the well method, uh, first of all, props to you. It's a very difficult thing to do. I demoed it on the first week of the show, and by some miracle, it did not completely go everywhere. But it's really important. Uh, it's really really important to be to be cognizant of where your walls are to make sure that your ingredients don't leak out. But the same thing is essentially going to happen. You're going to take your hands or your spatula, your bread whisk, and you're going to start lightly 
flicking in some of your dry ingredients into your wet ingredients. And by using two clean fingers, you're just gonna go around the well and start to incorporate the walls of the well to make sure that all of your ingredients start to come together. And as you get, uh, and as a rough dough starts to form, you can start moving in more ingredients and you can start the process of actually letting the dough come together. Once you've got your rough dough together, you're going to take it out of whatever vessel you're going to be, uh, that you're going to be using. Uh, you're going to have to keep it on your board if you're using a board or take it out of your bowl. And you're going to start the kneading process. This week, actually, my arms are actually kind of sore. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to love the standing mixer to do kneading for me. So I'm going to sit back and watch that and talk a little bit uh, and talk a little bit from there. But if you're not using a standing mixer or you're only using a standing mixer to combine your ingredients, you want to make sure that you have lightly floured your work surface and or continue to lightly flour your work surface to make sure that your dough isn't sticking as you're kneading. So I'm gonna take a look at my dough because it sounds like we've got a rough dough form and we'll move on from there. So you can see that I've got a, a bit of a dough coming together. Now this is this is ready to be kneaded. So if you if your dough looks a bit like this, or even if it doesn't look as put together as this, you're gonna start to flour your board and do some kneading. As I said, I'm a little sore this week, unfortunately. So I am not going to be doing my kneading by hand. I'm going to allow the machine to do it. So if you're doing that, just make sure you push down your bread so that the dough hook can get a handle on all of it and start moving it around. And you're gonna allow it to knead for about 10 minutes if you're using the machine. You wanna be watching it the whole time and speeding up and slowing down as necessary. I'm going to have mine on the number two setting, which is just above stir. Depending on what brand of standing mixer you have, you may need to use a different, you may need to, to figure out what speed is appropriate for you, but essentially you want the standing mixer to be moving it around, pulling the strands of the bread, and generally speaking, creating more gluten development. So let's put those on here and we'll talk a little bit more about kneading. Uh, if you're doing this on a board, which most of you are probably doing right now. All right, we're gonna get the rest of our dough off of here. And don't worry that I'm doing a lot of this with my hands. We're deaf, this bread is getting baked. My hands are also clean. Your hands should be too, hopefully. We take hygiene very seriously, not just because it's a pandemic, um, because bread making, is literally a hands-on process. So you wanna make sure that you are using as clean hands as you possibly can. So if you're kneading this by hand, at this point, you're gonna to wanna to take your palm, uh, specifically the bottom, uh, the bottom portion of your hand here, and you wanna push your dough out, and then use your fingers to grab the bit you just pushed and fold it back over. At that point, you want to rotate your dough about 90 degrees for a quarter turn and do the same thing back and forth over and over again. If it's too diff if it becomes too difficult to do with one hand, that's fine. You can use the two hand method. Essentially, it's the same basic thing, but you're doing it with two hands. So with one hand, you're going to hold your dough mainly with your palm. And on the set with the second hand, you're going to take uh, you're going to push your palm, use your palm to push the bread out, and then scoop it back, rotating again. So you're going to want to do this for 10 minutes, uh, and you want the dough to come together in such a way that it's tacky but not sticky, and that um, when you hold it up to a light source, nice and stretched, it performs the window paint test. You can see the light coming through it. Another thing you need to be careful of is scraping down your work surface. So for me, because I'm using a standing mixer, what's gonna happen is the bread will sometimes stick to the side of the standing mixer bowl. If you're working on a board, there's a chance that your dough starts to stick to certain parts of it, right? You wanna just make sure that you're getting in there and getting that up as much as possible or using a spatula to scrape down the sides if you can. This is to make sure that you get as much bread dough into your bread dough ball as possible but also 
uh, to make sure that you're just keeping your work services clean and that everything's getting needing, needed appropriately. Another thing to make sure of if you're using a standing mixer is to make sure that the that different parts of the bread are getting kneaded at different times. If your standing mixer is stuck on a loop, just kneading one particular part, um, you're going to want to stop your standing mixer, and you're going to want to uh, you're going to want to take that up and shuffle around your bread. Just put it down here a little bit. Allow the dough hook to get different parts of the bread. This is to make sure that every part of the bread is being kneaded evenly. I have now turned my standing mixer up to four, which is the second setting after stir. This is going to allow for the bread to move a little quicker and for uh, the pull to happen a little faster. If for some reason that isn't working or your standing mixer sounds like it's having a hard time, just slow it back down again. But what should start to happen now is that the bread should start to go around fairly quickly in the standing mixer and parts of the bread should tear off. And you should start to, at some point, hear a slapping sound of the bread hitting the side of the bowl. Now that doesn't necessarily have to happen. You can have different parts of the bread come off of the main dough ball and be kneaded separately. It's the same basic concept. The bread is separating and it's reconnecting, stretching, uh, stretching itself out uh, in order to make to, in order to develop more gluten. So just keep your eye on that, and remember, if you're kneading by hand, you just want to keep that process up. You will begin to feel the bread get less sticky and more tacky, and it may still stick to your board, which means you want to constantly. Um, Reflour your board with just a tiny little bit. You probably want to put down no more than about a tablespoon at a time. Now, my stand, I just slowed down my standing mixer. It was making a, a hard mechanical sound. So if your standing mixer starts to do that, it's a sign that it's going too fast and that it's not able to work the bread that quickly. So you want to slow it down to be more in tune with the bread. It will still knead perfectly well, so you don't have to worry about that. Once you get to a point where you think your bread is going to be ready, what you're going to do is you're going to take your bread and you're going to use uh, your hands to shuffle it into a ball. So you're going to take your dough ball here, and you're going to use your hands moving in a circular motion, making sure that your pinkies are more or less underneath it, but not so much that it raises off the surface, and move it around until the top of it starts to become a nice top ball. Once you do that, you're going to take your hands in an L formation, press down, take a little bit that pops up here, twist it off, and then start to uh, start to stretch it out with your thumb and, thumb and fingers until it is thin enough that you can raise it up and you see light coming through it. If you cannot do that with your bread just yet, um, or you can't do it with your bread such that it tears before you're able to get it as thin as you need it, then you need to need a little bit more. So this has been going for a few minutes now. You can see that this is not sticky at all. I can put my hand on it. I can transfer it between my hands and it's nice the right shape. So what we're gonna do now just to check this is we're gonna try and make it into a nice top ball. You can see that I'm not really putting in much effort here. Uh, I'm just using my hands, cupping them like this around the ball and just moving it round and round. Now the ball's still a little tacky on the bottom so it's gonna hold on to your board. All right, so we've got a nice top ball here. So we're gonna take, we're gonna take this little piece here. We're gonna squeeze, twist that off. All right, so now we've got a little ball of dough. I have actually a feeling that this is not gonna be ready, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our thumb and fingers to stretch this out very slowly. Yes, yeah, it's feeling a little tight. So my guess is this is not done yet, but that's okay. We're gonna try it, we're gonna see. 
and you're gonna keep stretching and keep stretching little by little until it feels very, very thin. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think this is gonna be it. So we're, we're getting there. Oh, actually, maybe. So you'll have to tell me, can you, can you see me through this? Let's see if we can, let's put it up to the light. So actually, oh, look at that. We actually can see light coming through it and it's not tearing. So do you see that little part at the top there where it's much lighter? You can see the light on the other side. That means that our bread is <clears throat> done kneading, excuse me. So we are going to, um, we're going to go back real quick and just put this back into a ball. Now, if your bread is not done yet, don't feel like you have to rush because of me. You have a lot of time and there's no rush on this. Bread is a process. It's not a rush. All right. So our bread is nice and taut. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to prepare it for rising. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to oil, lightly oil a bowl. And we're going to take our bread and put it right in that bowl. As I say on the show every week, I am using a glass bowl. So it is going to take a little bit of warming up glass. Typically, uh, it is harder to warm up a glass bowl. It doesn't come to room temperature. It stays a little bit cooler than the temperature of the room. So we're just going to run a little bit of warm water over our glass, over the bottom of our glass bowl, just enough so the bowl no longer feels cold to the touch. Once it's about room temperature or a little bit warm, we're going to put a little bit of oil in it move it around in there, and then start the rising process. Yeah, this is gonna need a little bit. If you are using a plastic bowl or a bowl that already feels like it's room temperature and is not cool to the touch like this glass bowl is, you don't need to worry about this process. Just take about a teaspoon of oil and start to use your hands to rub it about and create a thin layer, making sure that there's a tiny bit extra in the bottom of your bowl here so that you can rub it all over your bread. Give me one second. All right, so I have warmed this bowl by running warm water over the outside of it. It no longer feels cold to the touch, which is perfect. You just wanna use a paper towel and make sure that all the moisture is gone. Um, the, the only moisture we really want in here is oil, so just get the water off. And again, I'm using a paper towel because it's most convenient for me. If you have um, a regular towel or you wanna use your bread towel for this, um, you should do that. We're trying not to waste as much as possible here. Okay, so we're going to take our oil. I'm gonna free for this, but if you want to measure it, about a teaspoon should do, uh, a tablespoon if you're feeling like you have a very big bowl. Okay, and we're just gonna take this, and we're gonna move it around in our bowl here. Just let this kind of go around the sides. And obviously it's not gonna do that on its own. So, well, it's not gonna do all of it on its own. So you just take your hand and very lightly coat the bowl with your oil. All right, and, and you might be able to see, probably not, but we have a little bit of excess oil in the bottom of our bowl here. That is perfect. So what we're gonna do is we're going to wrap, very rude. Uh, we're going to um, roll our little dough ball in this excess oil so that it can rise. So let's take our dough ball back, plop it in here, give it a little bit of a spin, move it around the bowl. Then we're gonna turn it over and get some oil on it. We're just gonna rub it down with the oil. 
And actually, I think I put about a teaspoon in here and that might have been too much. So it's really up to you to decide um, what you think is appropriate. Looks like I spilled a little oil as well, so let's clean that up. All right, so now we are going to cover this with plastic wrap to keep the heat in, uh, sorry, to keep anything from getting into it. And we're gonna cover it with a towel in order to uh, keep that heat in. We do this so that the bread stays nice and warm as it rises and so that the rise uh, is very efficient. I'm using plastic wrap, but if you don't want to use plastic wrap, you just want to use a, ded a dedicated towel, you're welcome to do that. The one thing I will say though, is do not use a lid if you can help it. So the reason I say that is because if you use a lid and you essentially create a seal with that lid where there's no way for the air to escape, halfway through your rising process, your lid may pop off. Because remember what's happening inside the bread as it grows is that the yeast is eating all the sugars and from the flour and from the honey and it is creating carbon dioxide which is creating air in the bread which is allowing it to rise all right we are going to let this sit on the counter for an hour and then we are going to talk some politics so i'll be right back set your timer for one hour All right. So let's see what is on the whiteboard this week. All right, so there's a lot here. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the, I don't know if you've seen this, but right now there is an incredible tragedy going on in India. The COVID-19 outbreak there has been absolutely out terrible. The cases, I don't have the exact case numbers, but it's it's spreading very, very quickly. One of the pieces of context for what's going on in India right now is it is election season. There's a lot of campaigning. There are large rallies going on. The BJP party of Modi, which is more or less a, a quasi-fascist party, it definitely is a, the, a party with theocratic leanings, if not outright theocracy. They are, they are Hindu nationalists. They believe very much in having a Hindu state, uh, more or less to the exclusion of any other religions. But one of the things that they have exhibited is a wanton disregard for COVID-19 and for the way that it can spread and transmission and such like that. You've seen this with a couple of right-wing governments around the world. This is the case in Israel. It was the case for a long time in Brazil. So. Trump tried to play it down, right? There were a whole bunch of governments that essentially were playing down the virus. The difference in India is a couple fold. One, of course, it's one of the largest countries in the world, I think second only to China, with over with about a billion people there. And also, because it's election season, there are people all over the place. People are interacting with other people and getting them infected. Another thing is the healthcare infrastructure of India is, is very different. And because a lot of India, India is rural, it can be difficult to get to hospitals and, and things like that. So there's a couple of factors that make India kind of different than some of these other countries. However, what's important is that the cases have blown absolutely out of proportion. India has more or less run out of oxygen. There, are some, there's some bit, there has been some great reporting coming out of a couple of news outlets, Democracy Now! and Al Jazeera specifically have been talking about India. I believe a couple of other smaller outlets also covered it. But one of the reasons that it's spreading so fast, other than the factors I just mentioned, is because they, India has not had a ton of access to vaccines. Vaccines right now are being hoarded by the richest and most Western countries, typically also the whitest countries. So the United States, uh, some European countries, as well as the United Kingdom. And there have been some other vaccine success stories. Israel has done very well with its vaccine rollout. Unfortunately, they have most, most, 
They have been mostly exclusionary of the Palestinian population, which is very frustrating and is actually counterproductive, honestly, for all the reasons that I've said in past videos about how this is a race against time, and I will make these cases again. But so now there's a lot of pressure for these vaccines and other health resources to be sent to India. Now, of course, the pharmaceutical lobby is still pushing very hard against a possible patent waiver at the World Trade Organization. So you may have heard about the World Trade Organization. There has been a push more or less to say, hey, during this pandemic, because it's so detrimental, because it's so terrible, we are trying really hard to get these vaccines out to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. And because of this, we are going to say that the rights, the patent rights, the intellectual property rights to these vaccines can be waived for the time being. This, of course, would allow for many countries who are unable to right now because of fear of being sued to produce generic versions of these vaccines in order to vaccinate their populations and to ensure that we can go back to some relative state of normal, or at least that even if we have to keep getting these types of COVID vaccines every six months or what have you, that there is a good supply of vaccines for that to happen. And more importantly, so that there's not a mutation that occurs in the next however long it takes to occur, which invalidates all the progress we've made with the vaccines. So the United States has actually offered to send some vaccines to India. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but they're sending the AstraZeneca vaccines. The reason I point out which vaccine that they are sending to India is the same reason I did it when we were sending vaccines to Mexico. You may know that the AstraZeneca vaccine is actually not approved for distribution in the United States, but we do have a lot of them here. AstraZeneca has factories here. They're creating them here as well as in other places, and we have them to send around the world. I find it very difficult to come to terms with that we are sending vaccines across the world that at home we do not believe are safe enough to give to our populations. This feels wrong. I, there, I don't really have a better word for it. It just feels like this is not the way that we should do things. If we're going to send vaccines to other countries, and by the way, I do think we should, I think we should be involved in the COVAX initiative headed by the WHO in the United Nations to get vaccines to poorer countries. We need to be sending vaccines that we think are safe. Now, again, I don't think that the FDA is the end all be all of all safety regulations when it comes to medicines. There are plenty of examples where they have approved medicines that have turned out to be very dangerous. I don't really want to get into that now, but the idea that we are saying to the world as a country, to the world stage, yes, you can have vaccines, but only the ones that we don't think are safe. There's something inherently wrong and problematic there. And I think it's especially troubling when the caseload in India is so, so high, where there's the transmission rate is super, super high and where there are all these problems with infrastructure. The truth is what we really need to solve this problem is we need the patent waiver to go ahead. That is the first and very basic step. Honestly, we should not have private pharma companies, whether in the United States or any other country. All this should be done by universities and then distributed by national governments governments according to need. This would be the real way to create solidarity between countries, but also, and more importantly, to make sure that these medicines are distributed to the people they need without trying to create some profit motive so a few people can get rich while others die starving uh, or die of terrible and preventable diseases. So at the end of the day, the solution here really is to provide India with as many vaccines as possible, especially to do so with vaccines that we think are appropriate and safe, but that's just the first step. What we really need to do is take the next step and waive patent rights to these vaccines. If we're gonna do it temporarily, fine, we do it temporarily. Honestly, I think that these should not be patented. They should be available to anyone who needs them. Country, whichever countries want to should be able to mass produce these vaccines and inoculate their populations and really the, the real transformational step, the, the real change step that we create here is to say, no, actually, we do not allow a small number of capitalists to take advantage of 
research that is performed by universities and public tax dollars to buy up those resources, then resell them for a profit and allow people to die of preventable diseases. We need to take away the profit motive from all healthcare, but specifically in this case, from all pharmacare and either nationalize these industries or simply regulate them out of existence such that the vaccines and other medications that need to get to people who are desperate for these medications, especially in India right now, can get them. Finally, I just want to say my heart and soul goes out to everyone in India who is suffering right now. The footage coming out of India is really hard to watch. If you have the stomach for it, you should check out these reports. You should know. It's very important that we understand the consequences of the inaction that we are taking in Washington and around the world. But truthfully, it's a very sad state of affairs. And I want very much for the people of India to get the vaccines and the medication they need. So brothers and sisters and non-binary siblings in India, I feel for you and I hope things get better soon. That's embarrassing. We will be cutting that out of the, of the clips. Okay, so I want to get to a wonkier topic. So uh, many of us are working from home right now. My day job is allowing me to work from home right now. Probably many of your day jobs are allowing you to work from home right now. And this creates kind of an interesting dynamic, right? On the one hand, we don't have commutes. In theory, we have the flexibility to kind of spend time at home that we want to spend, to spend time with our partners, to do other things if there's a lull in business. But at the same time, you have to think about it in this way where although we're gaining the benefits of getting to in, spend more of our time at home and to center, our, center more of our lives around the home space, at the same time, we're also starting to pay for our workspaces. Usually when you're working in an office or you're working in any other workplace, your employer is paying for your workspace. But now with people working from home, you are actually paying for your workspace. You're paying for your rent, you're paying for your mortgage or whatever other agreement that you have where you are paying for, uh, where you are using space that you either are borrowing or renting or leasing or mortgaging or owning and using that as your workspace. You are saving your employer money by this arrangement. So many employers actually have begun to abandon the idea of offices. My company specifically closed one of its offices in response to the pandemic. Many other companies have begun to transition to full remote full time to allow them to save money on rent. So the question then becomes, where does this money go? The company is making all these extra savings by not having to pay for this space, by not having to pay for all the other things that come with an office. So if you think about an office environment, there are probably water coolers, there might be plants to keep people happy. Those plants probably get watered, those snacks, there might be snack machines that have to get refilled. There might be a tea and coffee station that has to get refilled. And other amenities that you pay for. You may have had an in-office gym. You may have had an in-office video game room or whatever. You, you get the idea. Offices typically had spaces in them for employees to do things other than work. Now all of that is in your home. The company is saving lots and lots of money because they don't have to pay for that space, they don't have to pay for those vendors, they don't have to pay for, for door alarm systems and, 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 and all the things that come with having an office. Maybe they let go some administrative assistance because their only purpose was to answer a door, right? You get the picture. So where is all that money going? The truth is, like any other savings in the corporate, in the corporate capitalist system, that money is going back into the company, which is to say that it's being funneled to the top of the company. Oftentimes, unless your company is completely employee owned, which is pretty rare, excess, excess savings go into the bonuses or salaries of the executive class, the, the executives of the company who are typically capitalists. Either they own the company or they own some part of the company. You get the general idea. So what I think is important for us to think about is that money should not be going to them not just because they didn't earn it or they don't necessarily deserve it because they're simply looking for cost savings and pocketing the difference, but we are now paying for the spaces in which we work. 
where that used to never be the case. Think about all the other expenses that you are incurring now because you're working from home. You may have higher electric bills. You may have higher heat and cooling bills. You may have higher water bills. Hell, you may even have higher rent. It, it, it's not unfathomable. And people did move around a little bit during the pandemic, right? You may have moved to a place to allow you to have an extra space in your home that you can use as an office. The cost of housing the employed and not housing as in where you live, but actually housing the place of employment is being shifted away from the employer and onto the employee. Like all things in the capitalist system, where it's possible, the burden will be placed on the consumer and the profit, the difference will be given to the capitalists. So what needs to happen? Essentially, I'm not sure how you would do it as a formula, as a formula for each individual employee, but this cost savings that the company is getting needs to go forward and belong to the employees. The employees need to be the ones who benefit from this cost saving, whether it's an increase in salary or it's a larger cost of living adjustment or it's an increased bonus or it's a stipend for snacks and things that you buy at your home or a stipend for your electric bill or if they just pay a portion of your rent. And by the way, this is not an entirely new concept. If you've ever had a, a mobile phone for work or a pager or a beeper, I'm dating myself a little bit with these references, but in fairness, I never had those, my parents did. If you ever had one of those devices that you didn't buy and own for your own personal use, oftentimes your work paid for it. If, you were, if they wanted you to use a personal phone for work or to add an additional number to your personal phone for work, oftentimes the company would pay for that portion of the service that they are expecting you to use for their benefit, whether that is adding an additional number to your line, getting an additional cell phone that you pay for and are reimbursed for, whether the company gives you a phone that they pay for, you get the general idea. Essentially, companies are actually already used to the idea of paying you for something that may be used for personal use, but that also is used for work use. What needs to happen is we need to take this dynamic that is already understood and important in, and to transfer it to the idea of working from home. If you're working from home, your company should be compensating you for the time that you spend using your home as a workspace. Now, oftentimes we spend about a third of our day, about eight hours of every 24 for that. So if you could easily say that for 28 days a month, approximately four working weeks, sorry, not 28 days, sorry, 20 days a month, approximately four working weeks, they should cover a third of your rent. You can do the math on that. 20 days is about two thirds of a month. You just do the additional math and you figure out about how much that they should be paying you extra in order for your workspace to also, so your home space to also be used as a workspace. This would bring the fairness back into the workplace and allow for the cost savings that the company is experiencing to go into the pockets of the employees who are also dedicating more of their time and more of their energy to the workspace now they don't have to spend as much time commuting and doing other things. I think this would be an excellent solution. It's going to be difficult and obviously, like all difficult fights, organized labor will be necessary. Unfortunately, as I've mentioned on past shows, there is not a ton of organized labor in this country. However, where there is organized labor, I propose that one of the things that they start to fight for is companies taking that cost-saving benefit and passing it on to the employees. It's going to be a tough fight, but I think it's an important one, and especially because we should set the expectation as workers that if the company is going to save money on things that they use to provide for us or shift the cost to us from them, we should be compensated for that because we're using additional time and additional resources to do the work to produce the capital that they then enjoy and that they profit off of. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about, kind of more or less um, on, a, on a similar thing here, is class politics. So do we have a class politics? It's an interesting question. So what is a class politics? The idea of a class politics, more or less, is that certain classes of society operate together electorally in order to get their 
in order to pass whatever agenda that they see fit. From a Marxist perspective, there are three basic classes. There is the proletariat, or what we understand as the working class. We have the petty bourgeoisie, which are typically kind of the merchants, the traders, some of the white collar, the, the managerial classes. And then we have the bourgeois, who are at the top, who are considered the capitalist class. So, in theory, if we had a class politics, we would have different seg segments of society voting towards the interest, towards those particular class interests. Now, does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen in the United States. One of the things that I find interesting about studying politics in terms of capitalism is that one of the many things that politicians do is they seek to divide us from uniting along our class lines. The truth is, I actually have much more in common with someone who makes my uh, same salary or lives in my same situation who's a Republican than I do from a rich Democratic donor. However, I tend to identify with the Democratic Party during primaries and sometimes during general elections because in theory, they're advocating for things that are closer to me. But if I was thinking about this from a specifically a class interested perspective, I would actually not align with the rich with the Democratic the rich Democratic donor. I would align with someone who's a Republican who is more in my class status, who is more in my class status than the rich Democratic donor. And again, those are extreme examples, but you get the idea. There are actually some really great examples of why we don't have a class, a, a class politics. In the most recent election, uh, Florida swung for Trump by huge margins. I think it was like 60% or something. It was very, very high. But at this, and, and the Republican agenda, and voted in lots of Republicans. On the other hand, there was a state referendum about the $15 minimum wage, which was over, which was approved, I think, by like 53 or 54%. Not overwhelmingly, but much, but it approved at a much higher rate than Democrats who were in theory in favor of $15 minimum wage were approved, which was closer to 30%. This shows that there is a difference between the class interest, which is the higher wages, and the political interest, or the partisan interest, which is the Republican-Democrat divide. There are plenty of other examples like this where ballot initiatives are put forward in red states and Republican politicians are elected at the same time that these blue initiatives or le more left-wing or worker-friendly or proletariat initiatives are also passed into law. The reason that this occurs is because politicians spend a lot of time dividing us on a variety of issues. One of the most prominent issues to divide us on is, uh, is religion, region of the country. So, sorry, some of the most uh, prevalent political fault lines are where you live, how you live, right? So think about people who live in cities versus, versus rural communities. Some of it is, is socio-political. There are also racial issues. There's a lot of way, uh, and religion, of course, is, is a favorite for certain politicians who use religion as a dividing line in order to stop people from uniting on other bases. The truth is, we do not have a class politics in America. But the other half of that truth is, we need a class politics in America. If you look at the way that the country has been functioning for the last 30 or 40 years, more and more money has gone to the rich or the richest people, the richest corporations. The rich, the capitalist class, actually do have a class politics because at the end of the day, both Republicans, rich Republicans and rich Democrats don't actually want things like $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, Social Security for all, nationalization of health care, unions for all, the PRO Act, things like that. So there's lots of fighting. There's lots of unifying on the capitalist class between the two parties, but they use that unity to divide the rest of us, which, which hampers our ability as people in the proletariat and the petty bourgeoisie to unite and to fight for more of the pie that the capitalists have been taking from us in the last 30 or 40 years. But really, this is the purpose of capitalism. It is always to concentrate that wealth, is to take that wealth from the proletarians and the petty bourgeoisie and to concentrate in the capitalist hands. That being said, building a class politics is going to be exceedingly difficult because many people find 
that the fault lines that we are often divided on are actually very important to them. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be. Things like racial issues, your tax credits, uh, the types of ways that you live and regulations to that effect, uh, whether drugs should be legalized, all these things are important. But the truth is not many of them, if any of them, are actually class-based. In order to really improve our lives as proletarians and pretty bourgeoisie, we need to unite with each other, not against each other, and fight the capitalists in both parties. And really, we need to do away with a two-party system and create and create a multi-party system so that more ideas and more variety of ideas can get passed. But the truth is, that's not going to happen in the United States for a number of reasons that I'm not going to get into right now. But at the end of the day, the only way that we claw back everything that's been taken from us in the last 40 years is to create a class politics. And we can't do that until there's real organization on the ground. And that's going to involve labor, it's going to involve unions, and it's going to involve local organizers creating movements that are class-based. So that people realize that it is more important for them to vote for their own material self-interest than it is for some other issue that may affect them. Again, this is not to diminish the importance of those other issues, but to keep in mind that in order to substantially change our quality of life, in order to make it so that we survive climate change, so that we have the resources to live happy, full lives, the only way we do that is by working together as classes and taking that money from the capitalist class. So to stay on more or less that same theme, I'm gonna talk about funding the IRS. Now this seems strange as a topic. It doesn't seem particularly worker centric, especially because nobody really loves paying taxes. But the truth is funding the IRS is actually one of the key ways that we enact a class politics, not on the electoral side, but on the governing side. The IRS has steadily been defunded over the last couple of decades. And what this has led to primarily is that the IRS spends more time and energy auditing and enforcing rules against poor and middle class individuals than it does on the rich. Oftentimes, this is because the rich have more complicated tax profiles than regular people. There's a lot more documents to go through. There's a lot more resources to go through. Oftentimes, those resources are stored in other countries or in offshore bank accounts or in complicated schemes domestically, thus making it difficult to audit and making it so that it is high hanging fruit. On the other hand, people who just have a W-2 and a 401k or people who just have some, or, or people who are just independent contractors or whatever other relationship they have to the economy, it's simpler. There aren't as many things going on, thus it's much easier, easier to audit them. And if there's fraud, to enforce appropriately. Now we can fix that by funding the IRS. One of the benefits of funding the IRS is the amount of money it actually brings back in. Funding the IRS is an investment in the future, not just because it allows us to uh, take control of the money that's coming in, but in a study from a couple of years ago, it actually showed that for every $1 you give to the IRS, $17 comes back to the treasury. That is an incredible rate of return. I mean, the truth is, if you told me that I could give a dollar to something and get $17 back, I would take that deal every single time. I would tell, ask if I could put all my money there, right? But we don't fund it this way because what happens is the more you fund the IRS, the more resources they have to go after the rich. And the rich who primarily control our politics through donations to politicians and being able to get pick up the phone and just call politicians and have them respond, really do not want their assets to be audited in this kind of way because as many reports have shown, including the Panama Papers, the rich are hiding lots and lots of money, trillions of dollars in fact, that could be used to benefit the United States and other countries from where they are stealing them away. The IRS then becomes a vital tool for us to begin to take back from the wealthy the resources that they are hoarding from us. If we can take some of that money back from them, 
Where does that money then go? It goes into social programs. It, it makes available, uh, it, it makes available the justifications for larger programs like Medicare for all, Social Security for all, nationalization of healthcare, and things like that. Now, as I've said before, I, I am a believer and proponent of modern monetary theory. However, taxes are an important way to one counter inflation uh, or the deleterious effects of inflation, and two, in order to maintain a democratic balance. We can actually make our society better and more democratic by increasing the funding of the IRS and allowing them to tax the rich and to audit the rich in a more, uh, in a more minute fashion. If we don't do this, we are going to continue to see that the tax burden is moved away from the rich and onto the poor, which will constantly make it so that politicians and other government officials have uh, constantly complained about things like deficits and our inability to pay for certain services. And whenever that arises, the inevitable conclusion has always been by both parties, we have to cut. And instead of cutting services that benefit the rich or services that kill people overseas like the military, the things that are always put on the table for cutting are these important social programs like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, which benefit people in their everyday lives. The point I'm trying to make here is, in order to get through the progressive or left-wing or whatever you want to call it agenda, to fundamentally reshape this country, what we have to do is make sure that we are able to tax the IRS an appropriate amount. Sorry, not tax, sorry, to fund the IRS an appropriate amount in order to tax the rich. This is the only way that we can achieve our goals. If we don't do that, we will forever be stuck waiting for someone else to find a way to get money to the government so that we can justify the many wonderful proposals that would make our lives better and improve our lives. So, the next thing I wanna talk about is our lawmakers. As many of you know, uh, the federal government has two branches of Congress, they have the Senate and the House of Representatives. These are primary legislators. They make the laws, they write the laws. Obviously the, the president signs some stuff um, and has his initiatives on his own. And there's a, a, a large bureaucracy that I spoke of last week on the program. But we don't really think a lot about what ethics rules are in place in order to keep them, uh, in order to keep them following the will of the people in order to keep them to the promises that they made us when we elected them and sent them to Washington. So one of the ways that we do this is to fundamentally change the, the way that we think about Congress people from kind of celebrities to public servants. Public servants need to be subject to ethics rules because they're making decisions on our behalf and they're making decisions that either hurt us or help us. And by the way, they, the, the point of my saying all this is that Congress people should not make decisions that help themselves directly. So what am I kind of getting at here? The point of this segment is to say that Congress people should not be able to own stock. What happens when you own individual stocks? Well, you're typically worried about whether that stock will increase or decrease, whether there's volatility in the market, whether you should sell or whether you should buy. Having these individual stocks changes one's behavior. And this is especially true if you're in a position of power where you can actively affect what's going on in the markets. In the special election in Georgia, where Raphael Warnock and, um, uh, oh my gosh, I can't think of his name now. Um, I can't think of the other senator's name. Okay, anyway, but you know who I'm talking about, the two newest senators from Georgia. The reason that they were elected primarily was because the arguments made against Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue were that, hey, they legislated in such a way that allowed them to reap lots of money because they cashed out their personal stocks right before the pandemic. They received these, these confidential briefings from the government that we were going to have to go into lockdowns and immediately they sold all their stocks 
in things that would have been normal investments during the pandemic and move them to online technologies and work from home technologies like Zoom, Teams and the like. This is outrageous, corrupt and unethical behavior. In theory, some of this conflict of interest stuff is already legal. The only problem with that is there's really nothing that enforces it. These people are not held criminally accountable. So how do we change the dynamic? How do we make it so that our politicians are less corrupt and so they have more of an incentive to do what we want them to do as opposed to <clears throat> to make themselves rich? The way that we do this is we completely ban the owning of stocks by any elected official whatsoever who can, or, any pol or any official who can change policy. So instead of just being elected officials who can't own stock, this also includes people who work at the head of agencies who should not be able to own stock. Because the truth is, if you're working in as the head of the Department of Education and you have stock in private educational companies, well, you can direct policy such that those companies get very rich. You then make a profit and can sell at a profit. So we need to pass a law to ban all of those types of people from owning stock. Now, of course, that's going to be very difficult because it's very hard to pass a law against your own interests. So there needs to be a groundswell of pressure, both from inside of, of Congress and outside of Congress, to make sure that these individuals are not allowed to own one penny of stock. And by the way, if we feel that there has to be a better way to compensate our Congress people in order to make this a reality, right? We can make it. A, we can make it a carrot and sticks, right? We can say, well, we'll increase your salary by whatever. Let's say. Uh, let's we'll, we'll say, look, we'll make, this is just an example, but we'll make the base salary for any congressperson $200,000. Right now it's 174000 But we'll, we'll make the base salary 200000 But you cannot own a single stock, nothing. And afterwards, after you get out of, of politicking, um, then you can own stocks again if you want to. But while you are in a position of power and privilege, you cannot own stocks because it creates conflicts of interest where you can possibly legislate for your own interests and make yourself richer at the expense of the people. And that is not why we sent you and um, any politician to Washington. That's not why we want people as the director of federal agencies. That's not why I want people in political appointments or cabinet secretaries. So it will be a difficult thing to do, but I think it's one of the... It's one more important way that we can fundamentally change the way our politics looks and feels, which is to simply say, if you're elected or if you're a policymaker, you may not, under any circumstances, own any stock at all. Okay. How are we doing? All right. <clears throat> so... Uh, because it's still relevant, a little bit, I'm a little late to this party, but um, hopefully you'll forgive me. About a week ago was Earth Day. I believe it was last Monday, 22nd, I think is Earth Day. So anyway, so we had Earth Day recently, and, you know, people were spending time talking about, like, oh, here are facts about the Earth, let's watch the Planet Earth documentary, you know, Hug a tree, what have you. But the real way to celebrate Earth Day, in my opinion, other than, you know, doing uh, doing things that <clears throat> make the Earth more beautiful, like planting trees and things, is to advocate against capitalism. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, it does, actually. Earth is a planet with limited resources. Capitalism is an economic system that requires infinite growth. That says that every quarter, every year, there must be growth. There must be additional profit. More money must be made. And that money must be shoveled up to the top. In order for us to survive on this planet for a long period of time, we are going to do away with capitalism. Capitalism is not going to save the Earth because it's going to continue to ask the Earth to produce more and more resources when those resources are finite. Even renewable resources are being consumed at faster rates than they can be replenished. Take trees, for example. So in the beginning of the pandemic, we saw these huge 
uh, before the pandemic really set in, we saw these huge wildfires in Brazil, in the Amazon rainforest. And then, of course, there was lots of logging. There's always been lots of logging there and other things. But the problem is the Amazon rainforest is being harvested and burned at a rate much faster than it can be replenished. Wood, trees, are supposed to be a renewable resource. But in order for a tree to get as tall as we need it for the types of things that we use to build homes and for whatever other projects we have, it takes years, sometimes decades, maybe centuries, for a tree to get that tall. So even if we plant a tree today, it will take a very long time for that tree to come to maturity. And we're asking the forests for more and more resources. We're cutting more and more trees. And even if we are planting trees at one, two, or even three times the amount that we're taking, we are going to need that tree to be older faster. And we just don't have a way to do that. Eventually, we will run out of these resources, which is going to harm the earth. Now, the earth will recover. It's a natural ecosystem that will survive with or without us. What will not recover is us as humans. And leaving this planet is not going to save it. It's not going to save us, I should say, rather. The planet can do just fine without us. But in order for our Earth Day to be significant, for it to mean anything, we need to advocate for a fundamental restructuring of our economic system such that we are using our resources in an appropriate manner and making sure that we do not waste resources to the extent possible. Two, advocating for a, fundament, a, fundament, a fundamental reshuffling of how we obtain our energy in the world, moving away from fossil fuels and moving away to resources that are more or less actually renewable, like solar and wind. And even the tides, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of um, hydropower that can be taken advantage of, although many of the places that can be dammed already are dammed, but you can use tidal, um, and you can create smaller hydroelectric plants that don't dam the water, but instead use moving water to, to, to turn smaller turbines to make smaller amounts of electricity for you know, smaller communities. But unless we're advocating for fundamental restructuring of our economy and the way that we get our energy, we're not really advocating for the earth. We're not really creating an earth day that's meaningful at all. At the end of the day, Earth will survive without us. If we would like to keep surviving on Earth, we have to change the way that we do business on this planet, which requires us to get rid of fossil fuels, to get rid of uh, these energy sources that are taking away from the planet faster than it can replenish them, for us to limit our use of resources generally, and to abandon capitalism. So I hope you have a fun Earth Day. I hope you took the time to learn things about the Earth, to, to feel more at home on this Earth. And remember that there is no planet B. This is the only one we have, and we need to take care of it, if not for Earth's sake, because Earth will recover without us, but for our sake. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is what should human rights be? Now this seems like a strange question, but if you think about it a little bit more, you'll realize that we don't really have a general understanding of what human rights should be. Different countries define human rights as different. So uh, a clear example of that is the Europeans define privacy as a fundamental human right. Whereas in the United States, privacy and data protection is more or less haphazard and not very well protected at all. So we have to think about what types of things we would want as human rights. And by the way, when I say human rights, I'm talking about things that allow for humans to live happy, to, to live happy, loving lives, long lives, healthy lives. So what are the things that would allow us to do that? What few things would are so universal that those are the things that are human rights, that those are the things that no government, no man, no woman, no whoever, no person can take away from you? 
So let's start with the basics and work our way up. Obviously, every human being needs food, needs water, and needs shelter. Without these, we will die, right? Starting at the very basics. These are what the most fundamental of fundamental human rights. Without them, we cannot live. So we need a right to life, which is to say, we need a right to be able to continue to live. And in order to do that, we start with the three basics, water, food, shelter. But there are other things that keep us alive that are important for our existence and for without which we could die or be killed. So peace. Peace is a fundamental human right because without it, we could die. If we're always involved in conflict, if we're always involved in war, then we will not live long, healthy lives. So now we have four fundamental rights. But what, what necessitates peace? Well, lots of things. Sorry, what creates peace? Lots of things create peace. There are, there are certain freedoms that create peace, right? Your ability to, to move, your access to resources. If, resource, if resources are more evenly distributed, then we don't have to worry about starving, about dying of thirst, and about not having shelter. So maybe a, an even distribution of resources is a human right. And although we're not going to create a definite list of all human rights, the exclusion of others, you can see how you can build up and make a case for what human rights should be. When we think about human rights, it, it's not just this phrase that we should use lightly. They should, these should be things, they, whatever list we come up with, whatever list you come up with, these should be things that we, as people, enforce on the structures and systems and other people around us that we should have and that are not allowed to be taken from us because they are our rights. They're not privileges. We don't pay for them. We don't, you know, we don't cast lots for them. We get them because we're humans. We get them because we're alive. And when you start to think about what those should be, you realize that the system that we have now for ensuring the distribution of resources isn't sufficient because many people have more food than they could ever eat, like we do in the rich and West countries, and some people do not have enough food. So if food, water, and shelter are fundamental human rights, then how is it that we can have a world order that allows some countries to eat and some countries to not eat? How is it that we can have a world order where some people are pushed out of their home, are forced from their homes, and some people have multiple homes? When you think about hum fundamental human rights and how we interact with them, you realize that the structure of, of nations and ideologies and supply lines and wealth and capitalism and greed, they don't align with these human rights. And in order to enforce our human rights, we need to change the world fundamentally such that Every human being has access to these things. Now look, my list and your list, they're gonna differ, I'm sure. Personally, as a privacy professional, I think that privacy should probably be a fundamental human right, that no, that no human being can, or structure or system can take away from you. But if that's on your list, that's fine. The truth is, you are not necessarily going to die if you don't have privacy, but, you know, you make the case for different things as we go on. But regardless of your list, it will always have food, water, and shelter on it. And if that's a fundamental right for every human being on this planet, you begin to realize that the way that we do things now simply won't cut it. We simply don't live in a world that honors human rights the way that human rights should be honored. Instead, we have a system of human privileges and we do not have human rights. So the next thing I want to talk about, and it's probably going to be the last thing I'm going to talk about today, is Florida's anti-riot bill. So recently, 
Governor uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida signed this bill into law called an anti-riot bill. And although I don't have a list of all the provisions, I'll give you some of the highlights. Effectively, if you are in a protest and one person is violent, just one person, and by the way, well, let me get to that in a second. If one person is violent, then everyone in that protest can go to jail. You don't even have to have done the illegal thing. And because you're there, you can be brought to prison. Guilt by association. One of the other provisions is that if you accidentally hit someone with your car and you claim self-defense, so if, if protesters are blocking a road or if they're blocking you know, um, an area and you fear for your life and you hit them by accident, you can't be charged. You could murder people and not be charged as long as you claim you fear for your life. Who else? Who else has this? Hmm? Oh, right, the police. So now we are creating the same legal loopholes for regular people who hate protesters that we do for killer cops. So, of course, this is incredibly problematic. Um, and by the way, one more thing about the guilt by association part of this law is that this is a gift to agitators. And not even agitators who are with the movement. You could have police agitators, FBI agitators. One person throws a rock, you kettle up the whole protest and you chuck them in jail. This is an anti-protest bill. This anti-riot bill, its sole purpose, and Governor DeSantis more or less admitted as much, is to reduce, if not eliminate, the amount of protest that can happen in America. This is fundamentally unconstitutional. But this is not the first bill that has some of these provisions in it. As you may remember, during the Dakota Access Pipeline fight, there were laws passed in um, South Dakota, I think, I think it's South Dakota, to make it so that if you hit someone with your vehicle by accident, then you got off scot free. No one could even charge you for the crime. And by the way, copycat bills of these are, are being put into legislatures all around the country. This is, first of all, it, it's fundamentally unconstitutional, but it's also fundamentally undemocratic. One of the promises that was made by the founding fathers, all their flaws aside, was that the people would have the right to have their, their grievances heard and their grievances redressed. And the way that we make our grievances heard is twofold. One, we elect politicians who we expect to carry our message to the halls of power and to change things. But two, we protest. And a protest, as well as just getting a message out there, as well as being informative, it's meant to be disruptive. The point is to make you feel powerless, to make the, the people on the other end of the protest, to make them feel powerless, to make them feel helpless. That's the point. Without disruption, protest is not, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't cause people to think more deeply. Now, some protests can be informative, but in order for protests to change anything, they have to be disruptive. And one of the, two of the ways that protests are disruptive is sometimes they break private property and sometimes they cause private persons to have to wait, to be uncomfortable. They agitate. So if you create a situation where the violence of one is the violence of all, you essentially stop people from going out and having their grievances heard. And if grievances are not heard, they cannot be redressed. We fundamentally take away your free speech, free assembly rights. We, fund, we, we take away one of the fundamental rights guaranteed by a democracy, demos, the people, rule. Because if you cannot have your voices heard, then the people in the halls of power will not respond to you. They will not redress your grievances. So it is my hope, and I have heard that it will be challenged, that this law and every law like it is struck down. Because if we don't 
stop these types of laws from coming into effect. We are going to create avenues where murders of protesters are normal and legal and fine. And perhaps equally importantly to that, we are going to take away the only one of the only abilities that people have to get the rest of society to view their problem. One more thing I want to talk about with protests is if you think about these large protests, these large marches, the media covers them, right? So not only are you using a protest to create a situation where other people feel uncomfortable, that discomfort attracts attention often the attention of cameras. Those cameras then broadcast that message or some version of that message, if it's not perfect, because the broadcast is not perfect, I mean, to the rest of the world. How is it that we would have had the incredibly large protests about the George Floyd killing if it wasn't for these protests that happened in America being broadcast to the rest of the world, making people feel uncomfortable, making people feel like something had to change. We created a world of solidarity. Now, it didn't last as long as it should have, but the truth is people saw it, people understood that what happened was wrong. Protest did that. Even violent protest did that. You don't have to agree with the destruction of private property. But the truth is that action, the action of disrupting private business, of, distru of, of disrupting private property, of disrupting private persons with power, is that you created an urgency about an issue. And if you take away people's ability to do that, or you mark huge swaths of people guilty by association, well, you fundamentally take away people's ability to participate in democracy. And once people can no longer participate in democracy, you no longer have democracy. The word democracy means rule by the people, rule by the demos, the people. So if you act in such a way to take away that power that we have to participate in our democracy, whether it's voting or protesting or even rioting, then you fundamentally change us from a democracy to an oligarchy, or to worse, an autocracy. And we can't let that happen. We can't let it happen in Florida. We can't let it, ha let it happen in the Dakotas. We can't let it happen anywhere. At no point should we sacrifice our ability to speak out, our ability to raise grievances, for some semblance of physical security. We're not going to get it. The trade-off isn't worth it. So I look forward to these bills, uh, to these laws being struck down. It is my hope that they are struck down because they are fundamentally unconstitutional. But given the way that the courts have been ruling, it, it's it's hard to say for sure whether whether they will. And, you know, it's definitely something that I'm nervous about. But for now, I'm trying to be hopeful that these laws will be challenged and that they'll be quickly struck down and that lawmakers will learn enough from the stink that is caused, has been caused from these, uh, from these bills that they will not try such a brazenly undemocratic law again. Okay, so that is about our time. So let's check our bread. All right, and this has definitely more than doubled in size. Look at that, beautiful. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to weigh out our dough. Well, actually, we're going to put a little bit of flour down. It's a teeny tiny bit. I actually have a tiny bit of flour on here. But really, we're going to put the tiniest, tiniest bit of flour on this board 
to allow us, uh, that might even be too much, uh, to allow us to roll out our bread and to weigh it out. Because we don't waste here, we're gonna take our plastic wrap and put it on our scale. I like to weigh mine in ounces. You can weigh yours in whatever you like. We're gonna weigh out. Um, this recipe technically makes one loaf, but if you want, you can make it in two. Okay. All right, so real quick, we're just gonna get this back into a bowl before we cut it up. And you want to try and get out some of these air bubbles, if you can. Uh, just because it's going to be difficult for it to rise, uh, sorry, for it to be formed up otherwise. But just get your dough back into more or less a ball. Don't worry about how it looks, because the truth is we are going to, you know, we're going to cut it up later. But just try and get it more or less into a ball. However you want to do that is fine. Gonna roll this up here. There we go. It's gonna get cut anyway, so I don't really care what it looks like. I'm gonna shape it and roll it. So, all right. So this weighs 55.66 ounces. So, uh, math is hard. Um, so let's do a three graded hollow this week. We'll say it's gonna be. Um, Close to 54, 54 divided by three is math, um, 17, I think. Yeah. All right. So we're going to try and get three. Uh, 18, sorry, 18. 18. Okay. So let's see how much this weighs. 21, it's a little too much. Okay, that's close to 18. So you need to be a little bit more than 18. Okay, so uh, let's get this one to like 18 and change. Uh, okay. That one's fine. That one weighed about 18.10, by the way, just in case you're wondering. All right, and then this one is 17 and change. Let's get it to 18 and change. So this is 1905. These don't have to be exactly even, um, but you know, the, even, the more even they are, the easier it will be a little later. Okay, 18.52. And then just to check my math real quick, 18.62. Okay, great. We are pretty much the exact same for all of them. So what we're going to do now, we're going to just make these into little balls. Um, just enough so they sit on the side here before we form them into logs. And we're just going to use a couple quick kneads for that. Just get them into a ball shape. Again, doesn't need to be pretty because we're going to make them logs. And you're just trying to make sure that any excess um, dough that you've put on these is all mixed together. Okay. This one formed up into a better ball. So let's make this one into a, a, a strand first. So using a little bit of flour we have on here, we're gonna take this ball, let's move this to the side so you can see, and I take my hand, just roll it back until a nice little log forms. I'm gonna do two hands. And I'm putting a lot of pressure on this, by the way, and the reason I'm doing that is so that it all comes together. All right, so now that we've got more or less a log shape, we're just gonna roll back and forth. Or you can just keep rolling in one direction, whatever makes you feel better. We're trying to get this log to be pretty long. Actually, I can put this away and bring out my tray, because this is where we're going to have our bread when it is ready. Actually, this is, these two are done too, so put them in the sink. 
All right, so you can see here, I'm just going back and forth. And I'm, I'm rolling from the thickest parts and moving to the thinnest parts. You pretty much want your logs to be even the whole way down, um, with the exception of you want the ends to be a little tapered, which will make your, um, which will make braiding easier. And then this will rise again. Oh, and while I'm here, and not really, it's not really a political thing, but uh, today is International Workers Day, the original Labor Day. Um, the reason that in the States we don't celebrate this as Labor Day was, is as a hope to reduce worker solidarity, which is why we have our own Labor Day. It's not really based on anything. Um, there is a reason why they picked that day. I just don't remember what it is off the top of my head. But the rest of the world celebrates their Workers' Day today. And today is International Workers' Day. So as we say on International Workers' Day on May Day, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. And if I remember correctly, I believe that's the last line of Marxist Communist Manifesto. Well, and angles. I always leave out poor angles. Angles, angles, angles did the work. Not all of it, but you know, angles put in some good work. So we should, we should honor angles at least as much as we honor Marx. I mean, I always forget poor angles. Sorry, angles. I don't know why I looked up. I don't know if, uh, I don't know what angles is doing right now. All right, so we got our first log here, nice and long. You can see that in some places it's not exactly even. Don't worry about that. Um, you know, you may end up stretching a little later. All right, we're gonna put a little bit more flour down. So your board should have a little tiny bit of oil on it, probably just from uh, dealing with the dough that had oil on it. It's fine, it'll hold the flour, don't worry about it. Oh, this one's going to be a little harder to do. That's all right. We're just going to keep rolling. Try to reduce the content, the, the length of these videos by prepping the ingredients ahead of time. But it looks like we may actually get pretty close to where we usually do at about two hours. So I am trying, people. But that's what we have the clips for. So you'll be able to see exactly what you want to see without all of my commentary if you don't want that. And if you don't want to make bread and you just want to see commentary, you can see that too. Hopefully there are no issues with this episode. Last week, uh, we had an issue where the sound was very soft. I did some tests with the microphone. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that's resolved. It's a little dry. And hopefully you can see me. Because that was an issue two weeks ago where it just didn't play. I was here, I was making bread for two hours, and lo and behold, there was no video afterwards. And apparently there was no video during either. So hopefully we've worked out all the kinks of this system. Um, hard to say, though. All right, so you can make as many strands as you want. I am just making three, um, and they don't have to be particularly pretty. Just try and make sure they're the same length. That's really, that's really the kicker. You really want them to just be the same length. So whatever you can do to make them a similar length, just roll them out, stretch them out. You want to do that. All right, so these two are about the same length. This one's shrinking a little bit, but it's all right. We'll we'll stretch it a tiny, tiny bit when we go to when we go to braid. All right, so the last one here. Fortunately, this is not something that I can probably that I can uh, do before we get you get here because this is all we're doing this together, we're doing this live. And the hope is, by the way, that you will that we will do this together. That you'll that you will watch with me. Sorry. 
you will watch as I do this, and maybe you'll make your bread as I'm making mine. This is to give you as much of an instructional guide as possible to do this. That's why I do this live. But also, more importantly, so that you can see my mistakes, um, so that you can see you know, any issues that we have, and we'll problem solve together too, right? That way, we can all get better at making bread, even though I've been making bread for uh, six or seven years now. I'm definitely not the expert. And bread is a difficult thing. So, you know, if for some reason your bread is not always the way you want it, don't worry about it. There are lots of, you know, practice makes perfect. But also, you know, sometimes the bread is different each time. Even if you think you're using the same amount of ingredients or the same ratios or what have you, sometimes your bread is just different. It behaves differently. You know, maybe it's more humid one day and you get some extra moisture in your bread, or it's drier and cooler one day and it doesn't rise as much. There are lots of reasons that your bread will look and act different on different days. So don't sweat it. All right, we are more or less ready now to break. So we're just gonna do our standard three, Three braid hala. So as always, you're gonna pinch your front ends together here. You're gonna go. Remember, keep these nice and tight. You wanna keep the braids as close to the top as you can, and keep pushing them up. All right, and then on the other end, on the other end, just take all the pieces. And you shove them underneath. Same thing on this end. You just take these bits here and shove them underneath. And now, I should have probably done this on the board, but so now we have a nice kala. Just hold it up so you can, you can see. Right? Beautiful. So now what we're going to do, we're going to cover this again. This is again to keep it nice and to stop from drying out. Now, if your holla is a little dry, um, you're welcome to paint a tiny bit of oil on it. You don't have to. Um, your wrap from earlier should have a little bit of oil or should have a little bit of moisture on it, so that should keep it nice and moist. Um, but the plastic will keep the moisture from leaving a little bit, and then the towel will also keep it from leaving. So we're gonna set a, an additional timer here for an hour. Now, mine didn't rise as much as it usually does the first time around. So I'm actually gonna give it a little longer to rise. So I'm gonna give it uh, 90 minutes to rise. And so once you've done that, uh, you're gonna wait for this to double in size. Then you're gonna set your oven to 350 degrees. While you're waiting for it to warm up, you're gonna take an egg or some water or some milk, just depending on your preference. And you're going to paint the top of your challah with uh, either a spoon or a paintbrush. And when it's covered all over and your oven is ready, you're going to put it on the middle rack for 35 minutes, rotating halfway. And you'll know it's done when it's a beautiful golden brown color. And it is 205 degrees at its thickest point. Now, if you don't have a thermometer, what's the best way to know if your bread is done? So being very careful, turning your bread over and knocking on the bottom, wrapping on the, on the bottom with your knuckles. If it sounds like it's hollow, then that means your bread is ready, okay? But this is a bread that doesn't, that, you know, it's hard to burn a bread like this. So if you're a little nervous, you're not really sure if it's done and you don't have the thermometer to prove it and you've wrapped on it, it kind of sounds hollow, but you're not sure, just throw it back in for a couple more minutes and try again. There's no real harm in doing that. Um, you may dry out the bread. Another thing to keep in mind is if you have the bread in longer than you want it to be in, and you're concerned about the bread drying out, or you're concerned about the bread burning or getting too dark a color, get some foil and just place it and make a little tent on top of your bread. By the way, there's nothing wrong with a very brown challah. They're still wonderful and delicious, and sometimes you'll have that nice crust on it. That's really nice on challah. And worst case scenario, if your bread is a little drier than you want it to be, um, just eat it toasted. 
uh, it tastes, you know, it might taste better toasted. And then, you know, if it gets uh, drier than you're comfortable with, you can always make French toast with it. And this bread makes amazing French toast. All right, guys, that is it for this week. I will see you again next week uh, for our next episode of Let Me Bread. And have a great day, guys. Take care.